So thank you all for being here, and of course thanks to the presenters for inviting me. Um, in advance, just let me apologize. I have a very stuffed nose and I cough a lot because I have a cold. I've been having a cold for the past week that I've been uh, having, having troubles getting rid of. So um, there might be some sudden outbursts during the talk, and kind of, I apologize in advance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about background, or the background especially in relation to these other grounds that we talk about, um, the foreground and the middle ground. Um, this is something that I'm particularly concerned with in my PhD research, where I'm developing spatialization algorithms and I compose music. And uh, primarily my research is focused on electroacoustic and electronic music, and I'm interested in examining aspects of ontology, phenomenology, and morphology in these musical forms, and I, as you see them in relation to space. And uh, we then say that music and all other art forms, regardless of genres, expressions, artistic intents, or vision, have one thing in common. And I say, namely, the uh, aspect of relations. Um, the common denominator that connects all art forms is that art creates relations. Relations between the work and the space, the space and the audience, one part of the audience to another part of the audience, between the artist and the audience, between the work and other works, so on and so forth. This idea of relations is, of course, prevalent in fields such as information theory, network theory, etc., etc. And it's particularly this aspect of relation that kind of drives my interest when I work with algorithmic systems of how you can use the computer to do automated tasks in kind of the creation of music and the creation of space. So in this context of relations, I'll present some modes, cases, um, objects, to discuss background, middle ground, and foreground. In an attempt to retreat and to become background music, elevator music, or furniture music, not so much to disappear or but rather to blend into the background and um, to make itself seemingly impossible to discern from other and everyday sounds surrounding us, the ambient foreground's a devaluation of foregrounding, according to Seth Kim Cohen in his book Against Ambience from 2016. He, in this essay, continues to stress that we cannot and we do not experience the world in isolation in any form. The things we encounter and experience are given identity by other things we encounter and experience. So all the things that we see and all the things we experience are given their identity by their relation to the other things that we see and experience. And then, so we bring this a little further and then we say then in this legendary story, which is now in the pantheon of modern music, when John Cage enters this anechoic chamber at the University of Harvard in Boston in 1951, he expects to walk into a space where he can't hear anything, a completely dead and silent space. But of course, famously, he experiences sounds where he's not supposed to experience any sounds. And then he hears two distinctly audible sounds, one which is the blood system and the other which is the nervous system. And then <clears throat> there's this process of interrogation and investigation into what he hears and then Douglas Kahn writes, there was a third internal sound isolated, the one saying, hmm, what, wonder what is that low-pitched sound? Or what's that high-pitched sound? From this book, Noise, Water, Meat from 2001. This third sound is the act of interrogation of what he actually heard and experienced in this space. So this experience led to the creation of four minutes and 33 seconds. This famous composition where the musicians sit still and they don't perform any music, but rather let the audience experience the background sounds and the ambient sounds of the space they're in, being it the shuffling of the, of the performers, the ventilation systems, people walking in and out of the space, etc., etc. Um, and through this composition, he suppresses this traditional structuring of the musical creation and the musical performance, and he gives ambient environmental presence favor. In a sense, you can say that this is the actual moment for ambient music is born. <clears throat> so 
But importantly, Cade shifts our focus because we're forced to listen to the background. And thus, the background sounds that we're listening to and experiencing become the foreground. So what was once retreated into the background as something that we had no conscious or kind of attentiveness to now becomes the things that we focus on the most and becomes the most important aspect of what we hear. In his 1962 book, Being in Time, Martin Heidegger seeks to analyze the concept of being. Of course, this is an incredibly dense work, if any of you have ever encountered it. But he famously talks about regards or these kind of aspects of relations in um, where modes of being or dasein, being there. And he talks about this in the analogy of a hammer. And he talks about the identity of a hammer is not defined by its apparent visual or physical characteristics. Rather, the relationship of the hammer to the other things it references, namely nails of wood, or the user, the human user of the hammer, is what actually gives the hammer the identity. Further, he talks about mitzai, or what is described as being with, not as a mode for discussing objects or internal identities of objects as such, but these objects, they're given identity by the other things they encounter and experience. Just as then we go back to what Seth and Cohen was, uh, wrote about in his Against Ambience, is that nothing exists in isolation, and where ambient foregrounds, uh, foregoes a devaluation of foregrounding. So, the mode that we can use mitzayim is then to see that there's a relation between all the objects, experiences that we encounter and things that we hear. And this identity of things is then referenced by this matrix of other things, of meanings, of perspectives, narratives, and other overlapping matrices, which continuously <coughs> form new meanings and new identities as we encounter objects again and again, and we encounter new experiences and new um, uh, objects. In most, or if not in all acts of composition of sound or songwriting, we are preoccupied with a production of space or an implied space. Um, whether it's a large, booming church-like space or a small, intimate experience being surrounded by a singer, instrument, or environment. And then, in creating space, uh, this is strongly related to our experience of our surroundings and the relation to our surroundings, our experiences of being within another room, with being in a concert hall, being in the city streets, etc., etc. Which is then further, um, I'm going to go into some different um, um, different aspects of interpretations which kind of do not um, necessarily relate too strongly to um, sorry, uh, sorry then later in 2001 in a paper called 3D Audio as Information Environment Lennox, Vaughan and Myatt introduce a thing they call ambience labeling information and they use it to describe 3D audio in productions of sound fields, especially in, they, they argue, an emotion to move away from surround sound to 3D sound, and as a way to kind of create um, very believable sound fields and to kind of to reproduce very believable experiences of actually hearing sounding objects located against the background. And they say, there is a class of information that is perceptually important, but which you don't focus on, background. Without this background, the foreground objects of perception don't actually make much sense. We might regard the, the, this background as a context for sounding objects, helping us to discern and position them. This is, of course, important on many aspects because here they're explicitly saying that in order for you to hear, to understand, and to engage with what you're actually hearing as your foreground sounds, you need to be aware of the backgrounds or the context in which you hear these sounds.
And again, of course, that references back to Heidegger's ideas in Mitzayn of how these, how the objects that we engage with are given identities in their references to other objects. And the experience that we have are given their value from the, from the other experiences that we have along with them and, and in their context. Later in, in film theory, of course, as well, this notion of background is very prevalent. And also in film sound, in games audio, sound design, electronic music, electric acoustic music, orchestral music, just to mention a few things. In his groundbreaking book, Audio Vision, Michel Chion assesses film and sound and the role that sound plays in film. In part, he describes sounds and music both external to the frame and to the story world. And for this, he uses a term he calls non diegetic and the non diegetic is a term for literary theory that he used, but he uses to describe something that exists outside of the frame, but it plays an important role in how scene is understood. So the film scene is again referenced by the things that lies outside of the actual scene itself. He also then talks about ambient sound and territory sound. It's a sound that kind of envelops this particular scene and then inhabits the space of the scene. Which, of course, then again is referenced by this non diegetic sound which exists outside the frame. <coughs> the, uh, the issue of the, uh, the diegetic, of the non diegetic, was further developed by uh, Van Tol and Heubers in what they call the IEZA framework. This is a framework for game audio and they seek to provide an insight and to help game audio designers with a way of categorizing and exposing relations between categories of sounds in games. Of course, sounds in games works in the exact same way as it would for film, and then again, of course, if you work with sound installation, etc., these things are all kind of intrinsically linked. The chart on the screen presents a way that they can think about the relations of sounds when they create different parts of the game. Especially in terms of sounds which are produced on the effect uh, diagetic side, it's kind of sounds that are produced by the avatar or of the avatar. And it describes sounds in uh, various settings. Uh, on the non diagetic side, it describes sounds that are produced um, off frame, outside the scene of the game, which then again influences when you're in the frame of the game. Um, of course, game audio is, uh, deals a lot with fictional worlds, but then again, so does film and sound, sound design, etc. Et and then we return to John Cage and this kind of his, uh, the creation myth from the, the anechoic chamber. And it shows that the background does matter. Indeed, we then saw from these other thinkers and from these other theorists is that the background is that which contextualizes what exists on the foreground. And although we'll, we'll focus on that which is on the foreground, the sounding objects won't make much sense if we hear them or try to divorce them in some way from the background from where we hear it. This background can also, of course, be sight, mode, methods of listening. In the liner notes from the 1975 album Discreet Music, Brian Eno relates his kind of creation myth, in a sense, his revelatory moment, that, like the one Cage had in the anechoic chamber, which is uh, listed under liner notes, where he reveals he was in a sick bed and he put on a record given to him by a friend. And the volume was set very low, one of the speakers was bust, so the volume of the music was just above the threshold of the background sounds, or the background noise. So, and then he says that he experiences a new form of listening where the sounds they was hearing was kind of coming in and out of um, his kind of conscious perception. This again, of course, relates back to all these other kind of aspects of listening that I've, that I've looked at so far. Um, likewise, of course, again, in 
his album Ambient 4 on land, he relates in a recording experience he had in Ghana, where rather than um, listening to any type of music, he would put out a stereo microphone and a tape recorder and listen to the background ambience of the place he was in over headphones. And of course, as anyone who's engaged in field recording experiences, of course, you listen through the microphone, you become extremely attentive and aware of everything that goes on in the scene around you, which you would then generally, if you would walk through the space, you would just take as being a standard, normal background sounds, which just kind of gives you the context and gives you the feeling of being in the space you're in. Through this actual act of listening over headphones, he's summing all the background sounds and he makes them into music, or as he says that, they become music, or they became music, rather. Um, this is, of course, um, this extremely important act where we then engage directly with this background and then it kind of steps forward and becomes the focus of attentive listening. So just from examining a few kind of philosophical, technical and artistic methods and experiences, we can see that the relation of the background to the foreground and relations between different objects is a means to understand and contextualize the things we hear and how we hear them and as we hear them. And then when we push and we retract into the background, we recreate a foreground and we shift our attention to the background. We listen through the transparency of the studio and then we recognize that we are actually listening to music. 